Hello, everybody. Um, today I'll be presenting bits of a paper that I co-wrote with uh, Eric Rietveld, who also isn't here. Um, and um, I'm also currently doing a, a postdoc with Eric Rietveld, and this is a, a postdoc in philosophy. I'm trained to be a philosopher. Um, I did a, a PhD, which was on languaging. Uh, and in this PhD, I looked at questions of typical philosophical questions of language having to do with normativity, linguistic content, and so on, uh, and trying to approach them from an ecological and active perspective, from uh, ecological psychology, from an activism. Um, and now I'm continuing this work in the, uh, with doing a postdoc with uh, Eric, because uh, we are now working on an ERC project in which we aim to extend the uh, ecological framework to so-called higher cognition. And so the plan for today is uh, the following. I will first briefly introduce the concept of situated normativity, uh, which is a concept which uh, Eric introduced uh, in a paper from 2008. Um, and then I will say, a little bit about how we like to think about languaging. Uh, and then in the third part, I will bring these uh, two things together and look at situated normativity in language. And I'll end with some observations on reflexivity. And all of this should take just 20 minutes from now. So um, before I can introduce the concept of situated normativity, I first have to say a little bit about how we look at cognition. And uh, here we have a picture of Alice in a field of affordances. Uh, the term has been uh, mentioned already a couple of times. Coming from an ecological perspective, we like to think of cognition not in terms of a subject and an objective world, but rather in terms of possibilities for action that are afforded by concrete situations. And on the particular way in which we look at affordances, we take affordances to be relations between abilities that are available in certain social material practices and certain aspects of the environment. So for example, here on the table, we see a stack of bills and the stack of bills says pay us. And of course, paying bills is only possible against the background of a complex web of social material practices that includes the material things that are bills, but also includes a whole web of, of practices. And so the idea is that our social material practices lay out a whole landscape of affordance, and every individual is selectively open to this landscape. They can do some of the things, but they cannot do other, all the things. And so the affordances that a particular individual is sensitive to, we call the field of affordances. And so this is dependent, of course, on the skills that you have, my one-year-old son cannot pay the bills, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but also on the activity you're currently engaged in, although the door affords me to leave the room, it doesn't really do so at this moment while I'm giving a talk. Um, and it wouldn't have shown up if I didn't use it as an example. And now, um, using this notion of affordance, um, uh, Eric introduced the concept of situated normativity first in unreflective action and he uh, gave the following definition. Uh, situated normativity is the ability of skilled individuals to distinguish better from worse, adequate from inadequate, appropriate from inappropriate or correct from incorrect in the context of a particular situation. And so the idea is that in, as we engage with concrete situations, we have a situated appreciation of that situation that is expressed in normative behavior. And this expression is made possible because of embodied skills that are shaped by our participation in social material practices. And we experience this, uh, we can experience this uh, situated appreciation as an effective tension, uh, which means that certain possibilities for action stand out to us and we enact them while others are more into the background. And so this is very abstract. So I have a slightly more concrete example of um, practices of keeping appropriate uh, personal distance. Uh, if you enter an elevator, you are instantly drawn to particular places in the elevator slightly more than other places. 
So uh, you want to keep uh, enough uh, personal space. This, of course, is based on social material practices. Uh, it is different between cultures. Um, and the idea here is that the, your behavior, the way you position yourself in the room, expresses your attunement to the normativity of the practice. So it's not that you first have a, a judgment about the situation which then informs your behavior. No, your behavior itself expresses uh, the normativity. And you notice if someone deviates, if they stand too close, then you will instantly experience an effective tension which can be resolved by moving away and once again keeping appropriate distance. And so uh, what matters for this concept of unreflective situated normativity is simply reliable, reliable participation in a practice that you do as the others do. And it's not about knowing um, rules or, or representing stuff inside your, uh, inside your cognitive system. Now, one of the, the, or the, the, the key motivation for the project that we're currently doing is what is known as the scaling up challenge. And so people have uh, learned about these affordances, about embodied skills, uh, and they think, and uh, one reaction that you get quite often is, well, this might be very interesting for basic or lower cognitive skills, basic sensory motor interactions with the environment, but once you get to the higher cognitive skills, you're going to need a lot more. You're going to once more need your representations and your um, all the things that you don't want to use. And so in this uh, paper, we uh, try to see whether we can extend this concept of situated normativity to, uh, in, in this case, language. And this means that we have to think about language in a particular way, namely uh, languaging as expression. And by this we mean, and here we uh, build on uh, ideas uh, from Gibson, uh, but also uh, from uh, Merleau-Ponty and from uh, Charles Taylor, who have all um, espoused a version of this. Uh, the idea that is, is that language enables us to make, articulate, and give expression to distinctions and abstractions. And so on this view, it's not the case that first there happens a little bit of thinking, and then the thinking gets externalized in language. No, the thinking uh, and the talking happen at the same time, or in other words, the, it is the talking that is the thinking. Um, and, and also the other way around, by learning to talk, we learn particular ways of thinking. And so one way of um, visualizing this is by uh, looking at this uh, display. And uh, one, the f just the example here is seeing color. So if I ask you to uh, look at the, the blue swatches, uh, you'll probably have the experience that the blue swatches form a group and they sort of pop out from the display. We can differentiate quite easily between the blue and the, the non-blue uh, swatches of color. And it turns out that people who have color word aphasia, who don't have color words anymore, they don't have this effect. So if, I, uh, if, if you imagine this to be real, uh, color swatches and I ask you to put them into categories, you would presumably, uh, if you're not colorblind and if you have a intact uh, color perception, you would start out, by, for example, by taking the blue ones, put them in one pile, then take the green ones, put them in one pile, and so on, one color at a time. But if you have uh, people with uh, color word aphasia, and this is uh, described um, uh, by Melo ponty but also more recently by David Doff and Robertson, you, uh, when you ask such a person to make categories in a, in a set of color swatches, they compare them pair by, uh, one by one, and then they see whether they are the same or not. If they are the same, they put them in the same group, and they end up at highly uh, strange uh, um, ways of sorting these colors. And so uh, seeing colors in the sense of being able to see blue in the the sense that we can, is the, uh, as Melo ponty calls it, the acquisition of a certain style of vision. And so I, I introduced this, um, this notion of languaging as expression in terms of an individual being able to 
make, articulate, and give expression to distinctions and abstractions. But of course, as we all know, languaging is in first instance uh, uh, a social uh, thing. It, it originates in interaction. And um, what it uh, allows us to do is um, to direct the attention of other people to these uh, categories. And so it starts out as an, um, as an attentional technique. I, I wrote a paper on this, uh, if you are interested in this aspect, that I don't have a lot of time to, um, talk uh, to explain it. But uh, when I uh, asked you, when you saw this display, to look at the blue ones, I directed your uh, attention to a particular aspect of the display. And this is not just uh, a mood pointing out, it's not just uh, directing attention to something, it's directing attention to something in a particular way. And so I uh, like uh, uh, DJ What He Knows way of saying this, that words act as operators of reminiscence in the sense that they link the current situation to previous situations and thereby they suggest a way of treating the current situation. Uh, when I... Uh, when you see this display and you hear the word blue, it suggests treating this in terms of its color and not, for example, in terms of its size or all the other ways in which you can uh, could treat this display. Now, bringing together these two notions of, on the one hand, situated normativity and on the other hand, uh, language as expression, um, what can be noticed is that both plays expressive behavior center stage. They don't start from an uh, idea of private rules or representations, but instead they start from uh, an idea of s sensitivity to situations which is expressed in uh, normative behavior or in languaging behavior. And um, this brings me to the third part of the talk um, in which I discuss uh, two examples by Wittgenstein and see and seeing how the the two come together, and so the first one, uh, the first example is an example of an architected work, um, and I just give a quote now uh, by Wittgenstein. He says, "You design a door and look at it and say higher, higher, higher. Oh, all right. The expression of discontent says, make it higher, too low. Do something to this. And so the idea is." is uh, as an architect is, is designing a, a building, uh, she might notice that a door that she drew earlier is uh, slightly too low. Now, this produces in her a situated appreciation which, m which moves her to redraw the door such that it is higher. And what I like in this, uh, this quote by Wittgenstein is that there's an ambiguity when he says the expression of discontent says, make it higher. Uh, so on the one hand, it... Uh, it uh, motivates the architect to redraw the door such a, such in such a way that it is higher and that it's in line with the, with the practices uh, or the architectural practices in which she is attuned. Uh, on the other way, it shows that this expression can also be uh, verbal. And so the, the directed discontent uh, that the uh, architect experience can either be expressed in normative behavior by making the door higher, by redrawing it, or it can be expressed verbally in talking by saying, oh, the door should be higher and having somebody else do it. And so I think that this uh, points to one of the first uh, things is that language enables us to articulate these uh, situated appreciations that we have. And in this first example, it was presupposed that there was a uh, a very clear course of action which remedies the situation. The door was too, do was too low, and if it was made higher, it would have been better. Uh, but this is not always the case. And so you also have uh, examples in which uh, the there's more of a vague sense of dissatisfaction. And here I, I um, have a different example from Wittgenstein, which is about finding the right word. So this is a, a quote once again from the Philosophical Investigations. Uh, so he says, how do I find the right word? How do I choose among words? It is indeed sometimes as if I are comparing them by fine differences of smell. That is to, mm, and that's to, mm, this is the right one. 
But I don't always have to judge or explain. Often I might only say, it simply isn't right yet. I'm dissatisfied, I go on looking. At last the word comes, that's it. Um, so that's the end of the, the quote. Um, and so here uh, Wittgenstein describes uh, a, um, a situation in which there's a vague sense of dissatisfaction in the sense that a particular word um, doesn't seem to suffice and you need another word and you want to find the right kind of word. But of course this is not something that you can only do uh, individually and this is where, where the social dimension comes in again. Finding the right word is something that you, uh, you can do together and that is something that in uh, writing this paper we experienced quite often. Uh, when you try to f describe these kind of vague phenomena, you're often trying to find the right word and this whole process of uh, looking at different uh, uh, candidate words, coming up with words, looking at how you used words in different papers, looking at how you might use these words in the future. Um, these are all uh, things that come into finding the right word and this is something that you can uh, do. And this is, so, so this is something which language enables. It enables us to jointly articulate these situated appreciations. And this is made possible by these expressive possibilities of language. And so um, this brings me uh, to the uh, final uh, point of the presentation where I want to say something about reflexivity. We've come across it I, uh, already quite a bit just now in uh, Vincenzo's talk on the meta coordination. Uh, here I have some quotes of uh, people from the audience who have likewise detected that this is uh, um, a, an important element of our languaging behavior. Um, Mark Dingemans uh, said in a, a 2015 paper that reflexivity is the possibility of a communication system being used not only for communicating about objects and entities in the physical world, but also for communicating about itself. Uh, and um, uh, he takes this to be a key element of languaging. And similarly, in uh, linguistic bodies, uh, there's uh, quite a, l a lot of emphasis also on the, the meta-regulatory function uh, of some utterances, where they get this, uh, uh, where this meta-level comes in. But there's, however, always a, a question of the relation between first order languaging behavior and second order behavior or reflexive behavior. And so here I, I take the first order, second order distinction introduced by uh, Nigel Love, and um, which also um, 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 worked on by, uh, by Tove Taylor and, and, and Stephen Cowley. Um, and so on, on the one hand, it seems that these second order reflexive kinds of behaviors are uh, more akin to the, to the sort of higher uh, cognitive functions. Uh, so it seems that this first order, second order distinction introduces some of the lower order, higher order that we had earlier. Uh, but we want to give a different uh, a solution to this question and say that the first and the second order are intimately intertwined. And so I, uh, I have an example here um, whereby, um, uh, whereby I want to make clear that the, the second order is always contained within the first order and reflection just is one of those activities that we do skillfully. It doesn't mark a breakdown uh, um, in our behavior, it doesn't point to a detachment from a situation, it doesn't put us outside activity, but it is part and parcel of our practices. Um, so you can uh, uh, compare it to this uh, traffic accident. Uh, of course it's true that driving, the first order activity of driving, and uh, the reflexive activity of handling the results of an accident are different activities, and the accident mar marks a breakdown in the driving behavior. Uh, but they're also in intimately related. Both are activities for which you need skills. Um, both are activities that are engaged with a concrete situation. Um, and although uh, the, the, the reflexive activity of, of sorting out the consequences of an accident can be seen in one way as breakdown 
in, um, in the activity of driving. It's not a breakdown in uh, the coordination per se. Um, and moreover, the, the explicit rules and regulations that, we, that you will use in handling the activities or handling the results of this traffic accident, of course, feed back into first order uh, driving behavior, for example, through training and uh, uh, social accountability. Our first order driving behavior uh, always bears the traces of these reflexive practices. And so um, we want to say, and this is my last slide, um, that uh, both first order talking and second order talking about talking uh, are both uh, skillful activities that can be understood through the lens of uh, situated normativity. As uh, Alva Noe says it, tripping, educating, dispute, innovating, ex innovating, explaining, articulating, trying to better express, these are ready to hand modalities of ordinary everyday language use. And we saw that earlier in the example of two philosophers trying to find the right word. Trying to find the right word is just one of the things that you have to do in order to engage in the first order activity of writing a philosophy paper. And so the upshot of this is that in order to understand these first order activities, you have to closely look into the, in the relations between first order and reflexive second order practices. That was what I wanted to say. Thank you. A uh, really interesting talk. Thanks very much for that. I, um, I was particularly interested, um, you started talking about, towards the end when you're talking about breakdown and I guess kind of implicitly referencing this traditional Heideggerian idea of a breakdown being a kind of a, a, um, a more reflective philosophical um, like outside of the situation. Um, and you're against that, you're saying this second order thing is already included in the first order activity. Um, I wondered if there was something to be said that um, that it is at least less constrained by the dynamics of the immediate task. So um, although it's there is that sense in which it's out, outside of the immediate context that the, the the immediate task dynamics. So when you're when you're thinking when you're trying to find a particular word, people will give you to a degree a certain um, a certain degree more play with with the, the kind of rhythm of the conversation if you're trying to find a word than they would if we were having a backwards and forwards. Does that does that make any sense or? or um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's true that there are many def different activities, uh, and that they have different properties. But I would say that even in the case of finding the right word, it is highly situated. So it is very dependent on the things that you were just doing, on the things that you are going to do, and so the context might be a little bit broader. And so I, I think that this is one of the things that we do, is that we have we have lots of uh, abilities to broaden the context. So if I look at my one-year-old son, his context is very small. If you give him a new, if you put him in eyes, this little walking thing, if you put him behind it, he just start walking. There's no, no question about what should I do or what I, I, I was just playing with these blocks. He just, uh, there's the situation is very small, but you gradually see that the situation is beginning to grow. So he now, now he's like, no, I was doing that. Stop putting me behind this thing. I'm not, uh, I don't want to walk, but he's going. And so uh, we acquire all, all, and this is where ling linguistic skills come in, because they, of course, allow us to reference things that are outside the current situation. And so I think that one of the ways in, of looking at this is that it allows us to broaden our context rather than having a very different relation to the context. Yeah, but it's more of a gradual thing, right? So it's not a either or, uh, and it's not a, a being detached from situations, but being 
attuned to a broader situation. Hi, thank you, Jasper. I'm all the way here in the back, but um, yeah, your table was here, but yeah, it's gone. Yeah, I had to move. I had to move. There's <laughs> things going to happen there, but um, um, yeah, I want to follow up on that. The the difference between like being into the situation and then stepping back from it and reflecting on it or looking to it. I I do think that there is some kind of stepping out of the situation. Although I completely fully agree with you that this in itself is also being in a pra skilled practice once again. But this second order skilled practice is in a way about the first, right? So there's some kind of intentionality there that's mm -hmm. interesting. And what I, we have done a lot of observations of brainstorm sessions where people at some point step out and start to look. And what they then often start to do is they start to explicitly represent. So I wanna bring in representations but not the ones that are in your head as mental mm -hmm. representation, but just physical artifacts, making drawings, writing something, making notes. And then that, that feeds back into the, into the first order practice again. Would, would that be sort of completely in line with your uh, framework or would you say, well, I, I don't, I don't want to have any representations in there, not even... I mean, we do, we make... I, c I can say, this is Erik Rietveld, right? So mm -hmm. right now he is, right? Yeah, Here yeah. he is, I put him there. And so so, so, and so we so make representations, right? The philosophical argument against representations is against mental representations and not against representations uh, in general. In fact, I have a, a, a project proposal uh, for funding which is called a radical embodied account of representation at this moment. So I'm very much aware of the importance of representations. And uh, as, as you say, uh, uh, so there are two ways of, of, of looking at the situation. And one way and the way which I think is productive is highlighting the fact that these second order or reflexive practices are themselves first order practices. Uh, so that is what, that's what you said. And the, the other one is that this practice of reflexing although it, it, it has this phenomenology of stepping back, it's not a stepping outside. So it's not, uh, it's, it's, it happens from within the activity that you can reflect on it. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't put you outside the, the, the activity in the, in the figurative sense, does it? <laughs> so, uh, thanks for this, really interesting. Uh, so, so, if norms uh, ultimately uh, emerge in, in situated interaction, how, um, what is your take on, um, on cross-cultural universals in, in, say, conversational norms? Are these always, um, do they emerge in interaction uh, I in the same ways? And, and, and what are the forces then that, that cause them to be similar across uh, unrelated language using societies? Do you have a, uh, uh, thoughts on that? Um, I don't have thoughts on that yet. <laughs> I'm also not uh, quite sure of what are the, um, uh, I'm not up to date on the latest research and what these universals uh, are. No, so there's I an entire debate on whether there yeah. are universals or not. Uh, there are some universals if you make them broad enough. Uh, it yeah, seems so, well, well, maybe I should uh, clarify. So, so the reason I'm asking the question is that if you have a radically emergentist perspective, then there's no need to assume any uh, universals or to expect any. Um, and so then if you were to find universals, um, then you'd still face the question of where do they come from? Uh, uh, do you want to claim they are all emergent? Do you want to claim some other kind of source, uh, biases, uh, cognitive biases perhaps, or uh, whatever? So, that, that, uh, so I'm wondering you know, how far your, your radical emergentism goes. Yeah, so I think that on an ecological approach you would uh, trace them to task dynamics that can be similar across different contexts. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not the person to tell a story about that, but uh, I think it, it, it could be taught. Uh, it's not, it, uh, there, there's not uh, 
it's uh, the the story you want to try is a very flat sort of story in which everything unfolds, and so you don't want to put it in the source. If that uh, if that answers the question. <laughs>